Hello and welcome back to Things You Didn't Know in Elden Ring. We are now at episode 20 of a series I never expected to go this long. Whether I'm spotting something weird on Twitter, someone's cool find on Reddit, or you guys in the comments dropping something really interesting to look into. Big or small, this series is very fun to make. So why don't we begin this episode? To kick us off with today's episode then, other than being hit by a firebomb, I'm here to show off an Ash of War The Spinning Strikes, which comes from Lavos in the comments. This is actually a weird Ash of War, one that I've never used before, it's quite cool. While the tip isn't about this, it's quite an interesting one, only on Paul Arms, you get it in a very specific way. You basically can hold it, and then while channeling it, you will reflect projectiles, as well as obviously deal damage at the cost of a small amount of FP. So as he throws a firebomb at me, I'm going to reflect it straight back at him which is really cool then this ash of war has a light attack follow-up for sort of spins or a heavy attack follow-up for some flipping action for some more fp there aren't many things in this game that are capable of reflecting like this obviously we looked at last time uh, the reflection of the parry the stormwall parry and during that we looked at these guys and how we can reflect their firebombs at them which is kind of weird because it does no damage to them even though it's sending it straight back at them a few people in the comments suggested that maybe it's because we've not turned the attack to our own attack of course, they can't hurt one another as part of their AI. So as I reflect this straight back at him and explodes at his feet, it's not going to do any damage because it's his own attack. Honestly, that's a really good Ash of War. The fact that it has the reflect can be very useful if you're being shot at by multiple targets with bows or arrows or whatever. The fact that it reflects things as well is kind of neat, but it's a shame it doesn't do damage. And to get it is really weird. You need this weapon specifically. No, not the Clayman's Harpoon, the Banished Knight's Halberd plus A, which you get by defeating a certain knight. Edgar the Revenger will show up here at the Revenger Shack on the west side of the lakes, or you can find him early game down at Castle Morn and defeat him then. It will ruin his story though. Then you have to extract the Ash of War from his weapon to then finally get it. Really weird, but yeah, it's worth the effort. I do think it's a good one. And a nice way for us to follow up and get some more detail on a previous thing we talked about. And on another follow-up note, our next thing is to do with Rock Sling, which we talked about being enhanced by the Unexpected Talisman Arrow reach which increases your bow's effective range or you know how far you can send an arrow strangely that seems to affect rock sling and other incantation spells and otherwise and as you can see that's the distance that we can do without it and this is the distance we can do with it it's going to go to that pillar and beyond basically turns out even if i unequip this and just cast rock sling as long as i can target them with this auto lock i can actually hit them the first rock will never reach but the follow-up ones like that second and third they just keep going. Despite the fact that there's absolutely no way for me to reach those guys by normal means, even if maybe I use the talisman, I might be able to. If I can technically lock onto the target, which does have an effective range, as you can see, as I step out of it, I lose that target and I can't target them now while spamming it. And then I step back in, suddenly I can. The rock sling is just insane. You can just send it all that way. But again, it's only like the off ones. Further, really weirdly, if I were to put it in my main hand and cast the spell, well, apparently it's not going to work. As you can see, they just fall down, which is what you would expect to happen in the offhand. That's how it's supposed to work. And yet, when it's in your offhand, as long as you can target an enemy, the second and third rocks, they're just going to keep going. And they're going to hit the target, which is incredibly useful to know if you are using this incantation. And I wonder what else this works with and why does it work this way? A huge thank you to Silver Foxer in the comments of last time uh, talking about this. Next up, we have one to do with this really silly weapon, the legendary armament, the weapon Devourer's Scepter, which is just a weapon that I would love to see a bit more in the meta, and we're talking about a build for it, actually, because there has been some changes. But as a legendary armament, it's rarely used. And obviously, it's got a really cool Ash of War, which explodes around you, dealing damage, and of course, stealing health. As a weapon, it is a physical slash fire weapon. And in this area, the Volcano Manor, there are enemies, as we've discussed in this series, that are completely fire immune. So if you were to bring, say, the Blast of Blade and use the Ash of War on that, which is 100% fire damage, it'll do zero damage. Which is apparently the same for Devourer's Scepters here. Because apparently, uh, Josh was telling me, this is a fire only damage. So it's 100% fire. So it should do a grand total, just like Blasphemous Blade's Ash of War, of zero damage to a fire immune enemy, such as this one. So, as you can see, 
It doesn't even react to it. In fact, it's completely ignoring it. It doesn't stagger it or anything. However, despite the fact that it's completely immune to damage of the fire type, of course, this weapon still has some physical, so we're doing much less damage to it. But the whole point of this weapon, this Ash of War, is to steal health. And this is where the interesting detail comes in. Apparently, despite this being a fire Ash of War, it still heals me, even though it's doing zero damage. So as you can see, this is a weapon's lifesteal that has nothing to do with the fact that it does damage or whether it doesn't. It's an interesting discovery to find that, yeah, it doesn't matter whether you're actually dealing damage or not. As long as an enemy is within that field, you're going to get health back. And of course, if there's multiple targets, you're going to get even more. And that's the ideal scenario. It's a strange weapon with some strange interactions. Certainly worth talking about in the series. Our next thing is all to do with a talisman. The Concealing Veil talisman conceals the wearer while crouching away from foes. Completely concealing the wearer's presence while crouching at that small distance. And it's a tool used by the assassins, right? The difference between, say, the chess piece and the this talisman is that even though while I'm crouched, uh, I'm still making noise as you can hear when I'm rolling around. As I step and I run around, I'm still making step sounds, which is different to the chess piece. Now, what you can see is when I crouch, it activates very quickly. At the top left, we have all of my buffs. And as soon as I crouch, you can see there's the icon, the concealing veil icon. So I am concealed while it happens. This is honestly best in PvP because you're made quite literally invisible until they walk in a certain distance around you. So if you imagine from a bird's eye view, there's a sort of circle of awareness around me and I step towards this enemy I'm going to be within that circle so he can now aggro on me although that's obviously a passive enemy. A great air example is going to be one that's more active like this patrolling guy. At a certain point he's going to reach that circle of awareness and then he's going to stop and he's confused because something's going on on that circle edge but he's not sure what and if I step away he's going to go straight back to his patrol then I step back in and he goes what's going on over there? Here's the weird thing. Rolling doesn't break the veil in any way. And further than that, if I start changing clothes in front of him, this also does not break the veil in any way. Despite the fact that I'm just really visible, obviously all I'm doing is crouching and even rolling around making noise. Let's stand up so I'm now suddenly within his aggro radius. He can see me, there's nothing stopping him now and he's gonna aggro. You know what it reminds me of, like the mechanic? It reminds me of like Elder Scrolls, you know, something like as soon as you crouch with high levels of stealth, you just suddenly invisible. They'll literally look at you and then you'll crouch and then they'll be like, must have been the wind. So if you're looking to do some stealth, knowing how Concealing Veil works could be useful. Next up, a rather peculiar scenario. Now, you've probably encountered them before. These are enemies that have the glowing eyes. More commonly, this occurs at night, and this is just an enemy that's worth more runes than normal. This can happen to pretty much any open world enemy in the game. So if you ever see one and you want runes for whatever reason, it's always worth killing them because they're worth way more than the average. Take this enemy. As I kill him, he gives me 23 runes. Watch out for the Caden Cell Sword. And as I kill the Glowing Eye one, of course, I get 114. So it's obviously a lot more. But that's just the concept of what I want to talk about for the actual thing. You see, in Celevis's secret layer at the Three Sisters, we have his hidden away puppets. And this is something that's been talked about quite a few times, actually, in the comments of this series. And I've gone and checked these multiple times to make this a thing for the series, but it's never really happened. Apparently, the puppets in here, their eyes follow you as you move around the room. And I swear, I've checked this many, many times, different times. I've Googled it and, you know, tried to find, like, an example of it. And I just don't see it. I even went and checked like each individual puppet that's in here. Their eyes, whether they have them or not, do not seem to move at all. But there is a really interesting detail to do with these characters, these puppets in here. And it's the fact that they are apparently actual NPCs, like living NPCs, enemies that you fight, but made completely immune to damage, as seemingly discovered by Reddit user Hipster Mankey. You see, we refer back to the glowing eyes here in this post. Any enemy in the game, in the open world, could possibly have the glowing eyes making it worth more runes. Hipster here found that the puppets are also possible at getting this effect. The downside here is that, yeah, they're completely immune to damage and that's because they're meant to be puppets, but it would seem that they're actually NPCs or AI used that you would normally fight if it was the normal enemy. This perfumer here, well, has just been made completely immune to damage, it would seem. And it's the same for the other puppets as well. Maybe they just forgot to take out the code that could 
make these guys have the glowing eyes. I've never personally seen it, but it is kind of cool that it's possible. Next up is one to do with everyone's favorite torrent here who you used to be able to make fly. You see, strangely, there was a relatively simple way to get torrent to fly, and that would, of course, allow you to get to places you otherwise shouldn't be able to get maybe earlier in your playthrough. To do it, the idea was simple. You would need to sprint on torrent and then leap from his back. And then while flying in the air before hitting the ground, open up the menu, go to system, go all the way here and quit out the game in basically what, like point three of a second. I was able to do it a few times, but it took quite a few goes, maybe 20 minutes of uh, attempts before I managed to do it. Now, as a result, you would spawn in a torrent that's just standing there, which obviously you're not normally able to do. And that's kind of a shame. It'd be nice if there were some gestures or interactions we could do, like petting or feed him, hang out with him. You know, in general, customization for torrents, still a big request. And hopefully we'll see something like that in a DLC. But anyway, from here, you would need to go to a ledge. So now you've got torrent spawned in. You go to a ledge and then try to summon him over there. And that would ideally, in this scenario, have him fall off and die, which is sad, but it's what you need to do. Obviously, with torrent dead, to summon him again, you'd need to spend a flask. And upon doing that, he'll come back. But he's a little bit weird. He's kind of like hovering above the floor. So as long as you don't jump and you sprint off a ledge somewhere like this high up ledge here, you'll just be flying in the air, which is pretty awesome. This leads to some pretty incredible views after I was doing a bit of running around. I found it quite interesting though. Some sections just have this intense forced weather effect like around Stormvale Keep and that hill. There's this wind effect and mist so you can't really see anything. But if I was able to run around far enough, the skies would clear up and I would get some incredible views. But yeah, it's fair enough. It definitely wasn't something that was intended. A fun trick and nice to look back on though. And something I realized, yeah, it really should be in this series. A lot of people probably never even saw you could do this at one point. Next up, we have one more from Josh, who has a comment to do with the walking mausoleums, or rather a specific one down behind me in the background there. This one is really annoying. Um, it's one of those ones that you have to, well, you have to jump to it. There isn't many of these. In fact, this might actually be the only one. But I remember the first time I felt that I had to do this, you know, when I was doing all of them in my original playthrough, and this being such a pain in the ass to do. How I did it was I leapt to it, as I said. And I basically went down to one of these gravestones, not necessarily all the way, way down, maybe halfway, maybe 70% of the way down, and then leapt to it. The downside of that is that you obviously have to make the jump, but the worst part is the fact that you have to wait for this jerk to slowly walk his way over to finally be in jumping distance. Then you make the jump, and then what happens if you fail? I failed like two or three times at least. It took way longer than it should have. But Josh let me know that actually there's a really straightforward way to deal with this one that doesn't mean, you know, hey, you gotta wait for it to come close, and you gotta do the jumping. And that's with a bow, any bow that you can get the range with. And obviously, as we've discussed in this series, the Arrow's Reach Talisman is going to improve the effective range of that bow. So you're able to take it out easier. Now, the weather's just turned on me, which is unfortunate. But all the same, there is skulls on the top of this walking mausoleum. If we zoom really hard in, we can just see them sitting there. And much as you should expect as you attack them with any weapon, any attack, it's going to break them. I definitely recommend moving around a little bit like I've done to get a little bit closer. And there we go. We can get a real nice look at the skulls now, like the one on the wall there if I aim a little bit higher. And there we go. Got one. So there's a pile here. Nice. Got another one. And another one. Beautiful. There's another one. Awesome. And just like that, I've actually not shot that many and it's already going down. I think I maybe shot seven or so, and it's dropped. Now let's very carefully work our way down. This is the gravestone that a lot of people try to make the jump from. As you can see, a lot of people have tried to make this jump and died. And there's also some handy messages here, like, for example, try remain calm. But finally, I've made my way down, and just like that, not so bad. So much easier than trying to jump to it and failing multiple times in a row. And as I said, there's not many schools you actually need to break before it drops down. So thanks to Josh for that tip. Very useful. But there you have it. Another episode of things you might not have known in Elden Ring. Some particularly useful tips in this episode for future playthroughs on New Game Plus. And as always, if you guys want to help out the series, get involved, get a shout out, then let me know any small or big interesting details that most people don't know, drop in the comments. For now though, thank you very much for watching. I've been Hollow, you've been you. See you next time.
Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos. Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes. Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice. To reiterate that it is nice. To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage. Is, uh, goodbye.